pretty irrelevant. But they've been relevant in the recent three years ago. The Grizzlies were pretty cool. They were kind yeah, of but uh, that, in this. That team's the, gone. There's none right. of those guys left. Right. I mean, but they're now there, they play, they were the yeah. team that played low to the the post. They were the last post team that had a little success in the NBA. But Jaron Jackson Jr. because his father was a good, not great NBA player. He gets well out of the butts bus zone. All right, wait, last. But, but did, wait, did you see Michigan State play at all this year? If you did, and you're telling me that that he looked like the number four pick, I oh, no. did not see that. Because he's all were, po. He's all potential. He all po. He's yeah, exactly. We have to finish this up, Paul, because I am just so fired up about how many busts there were in the first round of the NBA <laughs> draft. And ESPN went the exact opposite direction. They basically said there were thirty all stars in the first round. So we went through the first four picks, and that brings us to number five. Trey Young, Atlanta Hawks. And this one's confusing to me because I'm not sure what the red flag is for Trey Young as an NBA player. Paul, oh, I got? got I got it for you, and it's kind of deep. Trey Young is a beneficiary beneficiary of the uh, uh, Steph Curry effect on the NBA. He is the first college player to say, I'm going to play just like Steph Curry plays, shoot from all over. Jack, as soon as I get across half court, shoot more and more and more and more from all different angles, runners, one-handers, all this stuff. And it got him to be the fifth pick in the draft. Now, there's one Steph Curry on earth. There's not a second. And the odds of there being a second are pretty low. So Trey Young may not be a bust, but he may have been drafted way too high for what his role could be in the NBA. But if Steph Curry sort of redefine the game and push the game out beyond the three-point line, isn't that the kind of player you want? Because Steph Curry showed when you do that, you screw up the defense, and they basically have to cover with too much of the court. Now, if he can right. do any of that— and Trey Young can shoot. We were just discussing this. Trey His Young, percentage is iffy. He's a, he's a he's five foot six and weighs one hundred and fifty pounds, and he shot fifty percent from the field. That's not <laughs> bad. Uh, he he's okay. Uh, he's not not a terrible. I, no, he's a really good shooter, and he was shooting from so far away, and he knew that everybody was on him. The entire defense was on him. He shoots like Curry. It's just a little awkward. Okay, and number six pick, Mo Bamba. Oh boy, give me the bus metric for him. Well. Tall, skinny guys who need to put on weight is a huge, huge red flag. You go back to guys like Hashim Thabit and and other big men who never put on that weight. Remember Darius Miles out of uh, East St. Louis, and he he was unbelievably athletic and just long and like how how does he do what he does? And and if they never really put that weight on. And again, Mohamed Baba, if he's going to be a, a true center in this league, as you said. It's not that important. Could he be like um, down the road Ben Wallace, where he dominates the game with defense and block shots? Maybe, but he's got to put on 30 pounds. But it doesn't matter. Ben Wallace wouldn't fit in today's game. It right. Doesn't, even if he puts on weight, it does, seven feet, footers, even if you're talented, it doesn't really matter. You're going to be a little bit irrelevant. Although everyone says that he was working with the shooting coach in the offseason, and he really worked on his shot. So yeah, we'll, it, I wonder if Mohamed Bamba could look at um, uh, your boy for the New York Knicks, um, Chris Porzingis, Knicks. and say, you know what? Just because I'm tall, I'm not playing inside that much. Porzingis is not a banger. He gets yeah. enough rebounds and blocks enough shots, but he plays outside to in more than he plays inside to out. And if, if Mohamed Bamba just says, look, I know the lay of the land in the NBA, I'm going outside to in, and I'm, that's it. And it would be the smartest move of his career, I think. Yeah, I don't even see it matter or in Orlando. Orlando's got still, they're still so young, like Aaron Gordon and all those guys. Doesn't seem like an impactful guy to me. So I'm calling, Paulie, I'm calling them all busts. I'm, I say <laughs> you have six busts, and I am more likely to be right than ESPN. I'm just telling you, these guys are all. You are more likely to be right. Me. Yeah. So, but I do love, I like the 10 to 20 guys. I like the next Donovan Mitchell. I mean, Donovan Mitchell led a team to the second round of the playoffs this year, scored 20 points a game. I like Jason Tatum, the 6'6. Six eight guy. I mean, Mitchell's six three, but the strong two guard. That's where the NBA is. The perimeter player, Paul. Okay, let's go from pick fifteen through thirty. Who's the guy who leads the, the fifteen through thirty picks in scoring? Oh, Lonnie Walker was well. San Antonio shares the ball, but Lonnie Walker's great. By the way, Jerome Robinson, the kid out of BC, he's great. Uh, I love Zaire Smith. Everyone says he might even go to the G League this year because he's so raw. I don't buy it. He's amazing. There's a lot of guys. Uh, there's this kid, Troy Brown Jr., who the Wizards took at sure. 15. They're all these six five, six six wings. That seems like the kind of player you just need to load your team up with them. So I'm excited about all of them. I don't know which ones will be good, but <laughs> I like. I don't know if there's another Donovan Mitchell, but I watched Paul. I I, I literally spent maybe an hour watching <laughs> Zaire Smith from the tournament. He had like four dunks in the last two minutes against Florida in a great tournament game last year. The Texas Tech guard. 
he is really, really good. These guys are all really good and really young and really raw. So right. the the question is, you know, what do they project as? All right. Before we wrap it up, as always, how was your weekend, Pearl? Oh, my weekend was awesome. Went to a huge party in Brooklyn. It was the most Brooklyn party mm. I've ever been to. I mean, there were more filmmakers, journalists. <laughs> Everybody ran a film festival or did a documentary or was overseas <laughs> directing some movie. Or It was the craziest, like, sort of cultural New York City name dropper of all time. How about you, Paul? Uh, up at the log cabin up in Vermont. Went to a charity golf tournament, but I didn't play because my game isn't really up to snuff mm. to play in the charity golf tournament. Mm. Made a donation, drank a few cocktails, supported the cause, but I was like, I, I don't do well with crowds in my, my golf game. I don't mind. If I go with a couple bros and a couple drinks, I get I could have a lot of fun golfing, but when there's more people watching, I, you know, it's funny. I don't get nervous doing really anything else in front of crowds, but golf, you're really on a stage there. It's the worst. The first <laughs> tee kills me in golf. I feel like if I could go alone on an 18 hole course, I wouldn't be bad, but I am so mentally weak. Paul Pabst, Andrew Perloff, Weird Elysian. Perloff, a lot of fun this month. June's a really weird month because you know the NBA Finals, once it ends, you, baseball is hot but not too hot. Like August, it really heats up baseball because you're trying to get a wild card. The wild card is the most genius thing baseball ever did to extend the regular season. Side topic. But I think what's really interesting about the World Cup is it simmers for four years. It just simmers and simmers and simmers. And then all these teams, the one thing about the World Cup, more so than the action on the pitch, is the drama off the pitch. Like Argentina, Lionel Messi in his home stretch, in his prime, they're look, looking for a great performance in the World Cup, and they are just, you know what, the bed, and it's just disarray. And then Germany loses to Mexico in round one, and, and you know, all of a sudden Germany's on the hot seat, and Mexico is on fire. The World Cup is... It's got to be the least predictable sporting event on the planet, even though only the big guys usually win it. Yeah, so I is there any chance we'll see someone new this time around? Uh, like like a Belgium who seems red hot and really dangerous, maybe a Uruguay. Is there a chance that it's not going to be the usual suspects? Because I kind of, as a fan and some a casual fan watching soccer, I'm kind of withholding judgment at this round. I'm waiting till the, the final 16 because right now, yeah, you know, Germany is challenged, but I feel like they'll be there. Brazil doesn't look great, but I feel like they're going to be there. So how much can I read into the early games? I say, I would compare it to this. It's like the NCAA tournament. There's lots of fun teams like George Mason and Northern Iowa and, you know, UTEP and other teams that are really fun to watch the first two weeks of the tournament. And then usually the, usually, usually the real teams are in the final four. There's sometimes a wild card. You'll have like a George Mason or you'll have a Butler. And that could happen, like a Belgium. Even though Belgium's really good, for them to make the Final Four would be a big accomplishment. But then you take a team like Croatia to get to the Final Four, or Australia, or Iceland. That would be, now you're going next level. That's like a mid-major. But usually, France, Italy, not this year for Italy. They're not even present. Uh, France, Germany, Brazil are, are the teams to bet on to come out of the whole thing. Yeah, sure. I, I do. Um, I really love in certain teams. I still watch... To me, Brazil feels like the the highlight team. Germany was super efficient. Brazil, something about it, Paul, it, what am I seeing that just feels different when, you know, again, like I don't know the game like you know the game at all, but when I watch Brazil, I feel like I'm watching the Golden State Warriors a little bit. I think I that's a like good comparison. I feel like moving around a lot. I think when you look at a team like Brazil or Spain, the way they pass the ball so fast, it makes the other teams look like they're playing a different sport. I guess you could compare it to the Warriors where – what do they have, 300 passes a game? There's no dribbles. Mm-hmm. Clay Thompson will have a game with 50 points and 10 dribbles. They can do things that other teams physically can't. And, you know, if you look back at USA Soccer 20 years ago, USA Soccer didn't have a guy on their team. You know, Landon Donovan at his best, Clint Dempsey at his best, couldn't crack the starting lineup probably. I'm, I'm almost sure of it. I'm not an expert, but for Brazil or for uh, Spain. But we have usually one or two world-class talents on our team. They have like 13 or 14. There's guys on their bench that are world-class talents. Yeah, it's not just the talent, though, too. It's just it seems like they all know how to play together. Maybe that is talent. You know, it's funny about the basketball analogy. The Spurs, remember, they came up and talked a lot about being influenced by soccer. Tony Parker was French. Manu was Argentinian. Tim Duncan grew up in the Virgin Islands. Now, of course, Kerr, who is a Popovich acolyte, brings some of that energy to Golden State. So I, I think the best basketball teams... The other team, like, and I feel like this is going to maybe be a huge stretch. I feel like the New England Patriots, 
play that kind of team football. Does that make any... I feel like, I, you know, I'm a big system guy. I just like watching units of play as a team where everybody seems to be moving. Like, if you watch the really, really good teams, uh, you know, a casual fan will focus on the ball, but you look at the guys all around, they're all cutting all the time. To me, that's like the key to any team sport. Is that way too much of a stretch, Paul? I, I think I would compare a team like Spain or Brazil to... Um... I guess to a timing team where you just can't keep up with them, a run-and-shoot offense that's really good, maybe the Rams at their best back in the day with Kurt Warner. But I think it's it's mostly the level of talent. It, it, it Talent usually wins out in the World Cup because you got to get to so many rounds. It's but how like is same. that? Wait, wait, wait. That's impossible. How can it be pure talent? It's got to be team. It's got to be coaching coming up in the system because sure, some I'm, of these countries are just not big enough to have enough talent. Right, but I guess it's like the Golden State Warriors have really good coaching, but they also have three of the best players on earth offensively to work with. So you, it's like a cycle. You get the best coaches as well because the, the most popular coaches around the world want to go to teams that actually have a chance. Uh, you don't want to coach Peru if you don't have to. So it, it they have a lot more money to spend, the, the, the clubs, the, the uh, national teams from Brazil, from Spain, and places like that. Well, I guess, guess what? Real quick, yeah. by the way, yeah. I just got a great mid-show email. We usually don't check the Leisureman inbox. Roger Bennett, half of Men in Blazers, just tweeted, uh, sent a note to me. Heading to Moscow this week. Let me know if you want to uh, have me on the show. From our boy Roger Bennett, Men in Blazers. Well, let's get Roger on because it, uh, you know I'm on Team England right now. He's although, thinking of us. Yeah, although it is a little bit of an issue with my wife. I mean, I do not like well, this. Explain this. So we're hanging out, watching some World Cup this morning. No big she deal. Goes, man, that English team, they are really attractive. And then she mentioned oh. Harry Kane. She Is mentioned that a Harry direct Kane. quote? Attractive? Yeah, attractive. It wasn't just like, the word was attractive. I don't know Oof. what to do with that word. And then she mentioned Harry Kane specifically, which I'm fine with that. I'm, listen, I'm not going to compete with Harry Kane. I don't think many people can compete with Harry Kane. Yeah, he's no Cristiano Ronaldo. No. But he's pretty much top of the mountain. What I, and I actually said to her, I'm like, it's not just England. Every team in the World Cup has incredibly good-looking players. Like, the average soccer player has a $600 haircut, Paul. I don't know what is going... They're like male models running around who happen to be playing soccer. Yeah, if you're not a fan of England or Harry Kane, Harry Kane looks like the actor Josh Lucas on the cover of GQ. But, like, like you know how they get him primped up for the co- to cover yeah. of GQ, Josh Lucas? Imagine Harry Kane looks like that all the time, even when he's sweating. Yeah, like, not Josh Lucas' Sweet Home Alabama, where he's no. kind of grungy with Reese Witherspoon. It's He's got the hair up. It's something about, it's not that they're necessarily better looking people. They're just in amazing shape and they they have this confidence about them. It's not just England team. It's all of them too. Um, but, oh, by the way, am I, I, I've started to get some favorite players in this tournament, although uh, not all of them are doing well. I become, and I know they lost, uh, a huge Mo Salah fan. Tell me about Mo Salah. Like, I know Egypt is out of it and like they were heartbreaking, but he is such a cool dude too. It's weird because I saw a story. Mo Salah is considering quitting the U, uh, the yeah. Egypt team going forward. You know, Egypt was very hot as a team to pick for the World Cup because Mohamed Salah, he's from Egypt. He was on Liverpool this year and just exploded. He was a good player who exploded to become a great player, and he was the best player in the in the um, Premier League in England and for Liverpool, who had a really great season. And he's very likable. He came out of nowhere. It's weird because most players don't explode mid-career at age 26. They usually explode at like 19, 20, 21, 22. So he's a really cool, likable player. But Egypt just didn't uh, didn't put forth the effort. Salah had a shoulder injury. He suffered in the Champions League, so he wasn't able to play full tilt. But what happens a lot with these matches is these star players, once they get the worldwide blame of their team not advancing, they go, all right, it's time to retire from international play. Like, uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic should still be on his Switzerland World Cup team. You know, he should be on the international team. Even though he's old and he's playing the MLS now, he's still talented. And it goes that way. Like, look, go back to, you know, eight years ago. We talked about this a million times. Landon Donovan was old for soccer, but he's still probably the top two or three players we had. But a lot of times when these uh, European soccer players, I should say international soccer players, catch heat from an early exit in the World Cup, they tap out. Yep. Oh, totally. The other guy who really has always stood out to me and everybody else, too. I saw this headline today. Cristiano Ronaldo, not Messi, is the closest thing to Diego Maradona we've seen in the World Cup. And just as a you know a non-expert fan, I kind of see that. It's just magnetic when he's on the field. It's unbelievable how everything revolves around his foot. 
I'd say the difference between Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo is that uh, Cristiano Ronaldo has some pretty good players around him, and he could he could play outside and feed other people, and doesn't have to have the ball at all times. The entire Argentinian game plan, and when when uh, 